Hello. Welcome to this webinar on getting started in farm scale biodiesel production. This hour long webinar is presented by the National Center for Appropriate Technology, also known as NCAT. We're a nonprofit organization with offices across the United States. My name is Jeff Berkby. I'm outreach director for one of NCAT's major programs, the National Sustainable Agriculture Information Service, also called ATRA. NCAT has managed ATRA for more than 20 years with funding provided by the United States Department of Agriculture. We provide extensive information on how to farm more sustainably, including information on crops, livestock, organic certification, farm energy, and many other topics. You can visit our ATRA website at www.atra.ncat.org. We are grateful to the USDA's Rural Business Cooperative Service for financial support for these webinars. Today's webinar is the first in a three-part series of biodiesel webinars to be presented by NCAT. This webinar highlights the basics of biodiesel production and what precautions you need to take to avoid potential problems associated with poor quality fuel. We'll cover the advantages and disadvantages of biodiesel, the chemistry of biodiesel, and step-by-step -step instructions to make your own fuel. We'll also discuss biodiesel production equipment and share tips on oil seed production and processing. Finally, we'll share several examples of farmers and ranchers making their own biodiesel fuel. Uh, one program note, we have two more webinars in this biodiesel series. One on January 14th on biodiesel safety and permits, and one on March 25th on biodiesel taxation and production incentives. During today's hour-long webinar, you'll be able to type in questions in the box on the side of your computer screen. We'll review those questions during the hour and then try to get through as many as possible during the Q&A session with our two presenters at the end of the webinar. If you miss anything during this webinar, keep in mind that the entire presentation will be archived on the ATRA website, so you will always be able to watch and listen to the webinar at a future date. Now on to our webinar on farm scale biodiesel production. The presenters for this biodiesel webinar are Al Kirky and Rich Dana biodiesel specialists with the National Center for Appropriate Technology. Rich Dana is an energy specialist in NCAT's Midwestern office in Iowa. Rich is an avid biodiesel home brewer producing more than 400 gallons a year of biodiesel for farm and heating fuel. In the past, Rich has operated a community biodiesel pilot project in Grinnell, Iowa and served as president of the Iowa Renewable Energy Association and also legislative liaison for the Iowa Farmers Union. Our other speaker, Al Kirky, is coordinator of the Oil Seeds for Fuel, Feed, and Future project for NCAT in Montana. Al's worked on farm energy issues for over 10 years. He's one of several NCAT program specialists who answers farm energy questions posed by farmers, ranchers, and others who call our ATRA toll-free line. Al is also former executive director of the Alternative Energy Resources Organization, known as ARO, and has worked on sustainable agriculture issues for more more than 23 years. Al, with that, I'll turn it over to you to kick off the webinar. Thanks, Jeff. This, web, this webinar is an introduction and starting point on biodiesel basics, really intended to set the groundwork for our future after biodiesel webinars that will focus on safety and permitting and taxation and production incentives. Today, Rich and I will be working through the reasons why one should even consider using biodiesel all the way back to the field where oil seed crops are raised. By the end of this introductory webinar, you should have a basic understanding of how biodiesel is made, what some of the cost, feedstock, and equipment considerations are, and some of the resources at your disposal for getting started in on-farm biodiesel production. Biodiesel is any vegetable oil, animal fat, or trap grease that's been permanently thinned by a chemical reaction. Biodiesel was used by truckers as a fuel additive long before it was considered a fuel replacement. And biodiesel shouldn't be confused with e-diesel or any homemade concoctions like gasoline or veggie oil mixtures. The advantages of biodiesel to broader society and the environment are that it, biodiesel is biodegradable and non-toxic and has the best energy balance of any current liquid fuel. According to a recent study completed by the University of Idaho, four and a half units of energy are created for every one unit of energy needed to make biodiesel. 
that's about four times more efficient than grain-based ethanol production and over five times more energy efficient than making petrodiesel. In terms of emissions and pollutants, bio, using biodiesel emits far less carbon monoxide, hydrocarbons, and particulates. More recent studies of real-time biodiesel in, used in city buses and truck fleets show no increase in nitrous oxides, the red line here on this graph, and contrary to what this older table shows. Those studies were conducted in Chicago, Denver, and San Francisco. In addition, biodiesel emits 78% less carbon, mono excuse me, carbon dioxide in its full life cycle compared to conventional petrodiesel. Here's some of the closer to home advantages of biodiesel. Biodiesel is a mild solvent, so one may have to replace rubber hoses and lines with newer composite lines that don't weaken when exposed to biodiesel. But expensive engine modifications or retrofits are unnecessary. Compared to making other liquid fuels, biodiesel is more within the reach of farmers and ranchers as the production technology can be relatively simple. Biodiesel is 8% lower in BTU content than petroleum diesel, but because biodiesel is a denser fuel, one actually sees about a 3.5 to 6% loss at peak power. That would be pulling under a maximum load or at full acceleration. Mixing biodiesel with petrodiesel or an additive can overcome the gelling problems that you see in the right-hand photo here. And some oil seeds have better cold flow properties as well. Because biodiesel is biodegradable, one of its advantages, it's also a disadvantage in that biodiesel has a six-month shelf life unless additives are used to extend that stability. Like any other fuel, it needs to be stored properly, away from sunlight and water, and with minimum exposure to air over time. We also have to keep in mind that engine manufacturers are slowly warming to biodiesel, but it really person shouldn't take it for granted that your warranty will be honored if you use biodiesel. That the manufacturer may dictate what biodiesel blends and what type of biodiesel feedstock is allowable if they allow biodiesel use at all within their warranty parameters. I would suggest that the first three disadvantages are really just challenges that can be solved by anyone serious about biodiesel production and use on farm. Rich is going to take us through the basic chemistry and a simple example of making biodiesel as an illustration of the whole process. Rich? Thanks, Al. As Al said, um, I'm going to go over a few slides that will um, explain some of the, the basics of making biodiesel. Of course, we've got a limited amount of time today, so what I'm going to try and do is uh, just provide a starting place for you folks out there to do your own research on how to make biodiesel. Uh, what I want to do is show how simple the process is. It's uh, a very basic process and something that's easily manageable by folks uh, in, on, on a farm scale. Um, and we're also going to talk about some of the problems that can occur. Um, first off, what I want to do is define some terms that I'll be using today. Uh, if you're not uh, familiar with these terms or if you're a newbie to making biodiesel, these, um, these may be new to you. Um, and the first one is transesterification. We'll start with the big one. Uh, it's a long word, but it basically just means that uh, we're performing a conversion of esters. We're replacing the glycerol component of vegetable oil with methanol. We'll talk more about that soon. Glycerol or glycerin are two terms that you often hear used interchangeably, and that's fine. Um, they both basically, in, in the context of biodiesel, mean the same thing. Chemically, uh, glycerol uh, refers to pure glycerin, um, but uh, in, in terms of um, basic bio, biodiesel production, they're pretty much interchangeable. KOH represents potassium hydroxide, uh, which is commonly known as caustic soda or potash. It's an industrial chemical um, that's most commonly used in the production of soft soaps uh, and detergents. And NaOH is sodium hydroxide, which most people know as common household lye. Um, methoxide is the methanol and catalyst mixture. This is the mixture of 
uh, of alcohol and uh, one of the the, um, the two chemical catalysts I just described. And finally, titration. Titration is volumetric analysis, which determines how many free fatty acids are present and how much extra catalyst is required to drive the biodiesel reaction to completion. Now, I won't go into titration too much today, but uh, just to let you know, titration is a simple benchtop test. Uh, what you see here is a group of folks from the Iowa Department of Natural Resources uh, learning how to do a titration and as you can see uh, there's not a lot of uh, fancy equipment involved it's a it's a very simple uh, test and um, there are several good videos on the web that will show you how to do a titration and with a little practice you can easily teach yourself uh, what we have here is a graphic depiction of the biodiesel process uh, now all fats and oils are made up of triglycerides which are basically free fatty acids combined with 7 to 13 percent glycerol and that's uh, represented on the left hand side of your screen uh, by the yellow and blue. Um, what we're going to do is perform a transesterification and that describes the reaction where the glycerol is replaced with a lighter and less viscous alcohol uh, that would be methanol or ethanol and in our case we generally use methanol. Um, with the use of the catalyst we're able to break the glycerol off and replace it with the methanol and what we're left with then is biodiesel and glycerin. Now almost any vegetable oil or animal fat combined with methyl or ethyl alcohol and a catalyst can be used to produce uh, biodiesel. Um, virgin vegetable oil requires about 5.5 grams per liter of uh, NaOH or 7 grams per liter of KOH. Waste oil, like uh, the restaurant fire, uh, fryer grease that you may have heard about people making biodiesel with, must be titrated. We must use that titration process I re referred to before to determine the acidity and figure out how much extra catalyst we need to add. Um, uh, one pound of glycerin is created for every 10 pounds of biodiesel. We're going to talk about this in a little while. You're going to be producing quite a bit of glycerin and managing that waste stream is one of the most important things to consider uh, before you decide whether or not you're going to make your own biodiesel. And finally, um, your biodiesel must meet ASTM 6751 specifications to be sold commercially. Um, those are standards that uh, determine the flashpoint stability and purity of your biodiesel. Now, you may be asking yourself which of the two catalysts you want to use. So, uh, a few things that um, define the characteristics of each of those are listed here. Um, potassium hydroxide basically absorbs less water, uh, it cakes less, um, it, it dissolves more readily. The glycerin remains liquid, it's less harmful to plants, and it's basically more for forgiving, which is why it's gaining popularity uh, among small biodiesel brewers. Sodium hydroxide, on the other hand, is less expensive, it's more readily available, uh, less chemical is required, and it makes solid glycerin, which uh, has its advantages if you plan to manufacture things like bar soap. Now the next set of slides illustrates how simple the basic process can be. I'm going to be going through this pretty quickly, um, so if you want to try it at home, uh, you can download our do-it-yourself production basics publication by visiting the website address you see here. There are several biodiesel publications available there. There are lots of resources and it's a great place to get started. Now, talking about actually making biodiesel, we can't talk too much about safety. Uh, safety has got to be the most uh, primary thought in your mind at any time when you're making your own biodiesel. Uh, we're going to make a small batch here and even making just one liter of biodiesel, you've got to make sure you've got some chemical resistant gloves, uh, some safety glasses, or even better, a full face shield. Uh, long sleeve pants and uh, shirt, um, shoes, you know, uh, what you don't want to see is uh, 
what happens when somebody spills uh, caustic chemicals on their flip-flops and there are pictures out there on the web um, so make sure you're you're wearing a good set of work clothes and even a Tyvek apron uh, can be a really good idea we're going to talk a little bit about safety today but um, please join us for our safety and permitting webinar on the 14th of January now one important thing when making your first small batch of diesel is please do not try and make a batch of biodiesel in a blender uh, you'll see some older publications some older books and websites where people describe mixing biodiesel in a blender and even worse mixing their methoxide in a blender and take it from somebody who knows from experience uh, you do not want to mix biodiesel in a blender the rubber gaskets and, and plastic parts are not meant uh, for use with chemicals and the high RPM mixing motor can cause splashing and all sorts of bad things can happen so uh, please um, do not mix any biodiesel in a blender on the other hand we're going to be mixing our first batch in a two liter plastic bottle this is a technique com commonly known on the web as the Dr. Pepper technique and uh, you might want to do a web search about that and, and read more about it but I'm going to just go through it real quickly here uh, what you see uh, in this first slide is I am measuring out the components for our methoxide uh, I've got my catalyst on a scale using a regular kitchen household scale uh, and I'm measuring out 250 milliliters of methanol in this case for such a small amount you can use heat uh, fuel line additive make sure if you want to try this at home that you don't use iso heat in the red bottle that's isopropyl alcohol and uh, that's uh, not what you want to use uh, we're going to combine our catalyst and our methanol in a jar with a tight fitting lid make sure that lids on tight and then we're going to measure out a liter of new vegetable cooking oil into our two liter soda bottle you see I've got my oil in my bottle here and I'm adding my methoxide mixture uh, to that um, uh, a side note it you'll get a better reaction if you heat your oil to about 130 degrees but uh, it can be dangerous to heat oil on a stove um, if you aren't watching it or um, if you don't have a good uh, kitchen thermometer you can just leave uh, your oil out um, on a sunny day before for a couple hours before you do your mix and that will actually help um, raise the temperature just enough to get a, a better reaction but uh, you can even do it at, at room temperature so after we've got our components in there we're going to put the uh, top on tightly and we will gently shake the mixture um, we're going to mix it uh, for about a minute and then for about 15 seconds every few minutes after that for about a half an hour you'll read different times on the web different people uh, will say to, to mix it longer or shorter the point is to make sure that it's thoroughly mixed and um, you can do that by uh, just just giving it a good shake every few minutes for about a half an hour so what you see here is the mixture right after it's been uh, been mixed up it looks kind of like orange juice uh, but it won't be long before we will begin to see the sep separation take place and here you see uh, a little bit of glycerin starting to form at the bottom of the bottle um, the glycerin drops out pretty quickly and eventually the biodiesel will will clear up and here you see uh, the complete process you see the biodiesel on top and the glycerin on the bottom so if you choose to do this experiment make sure that you dispose of the glycerin safely and we'll be talking about how to do that a little bit later now I'm going to move on to talking about batch processing um, some really important things to think about when you are uh, when you're getting ready um, to start processing on a farm scale plan your project in advance um, try and take as many of the variables out of the process as possible again safety first I'm gonna say that a few more times today and we'll talk more about that in a future webinar but also make sure you're complying with local regulations and ordinances these two items um, safety 
and compliance. Uh, if you can't make your biodiesel safely and legally, then maybe uh, making biodiesel isn't for you. Uh, materials handling, uh, you need to think about your feedstock. Do you have a, a good supply? Do you have uh, a facility to store it? Are you moving it around efficiently? After all, time is money and um, materials handling can burn up a lot of time. Waste handling, do you have a plan for the, all that glycerol we talked about? And then sustainability, there's sort of a, an old cliche about uh, sustainability being a three-legged stool where you have to consider the economic, environmental, and community impacts. Uh, it's important to consider all of the potential impacts before you begin your project because it's not worth the money that you're going to save if you're creating headaches for yourself and for your neighbors. All right, batch processing. Um, when, when I talk about batch processing, we're talking about making one batch of biodiesel at a time as opposed to a continuous process, process like they do at the, the big biodiesel plants. Um, we're going to start our batch process by moving our vegetable oil into uh, a reactor. We're going to raise that to about 130 degrees. And um, and then, uh, oh, by the way, there are several batch processor designs out there on the market. And uh, we'll be talking about that a little bit more. But all the steps I'm describing here are common to all the designs out there. Uh, the next step is we're going to begin mixing. And in the old days, we used to do this with a paddle mixer. Now we found that it works much better to use a circulating pump, drawing the biodiesel from the bottom of the reactor to the top of the reactor. And at this point, we're going to introduce our methoxide mixture into the reactor. Now, remember, again, the methoxide handling is the most dangerous step in the process. So we don't want to pour our methanol uh, our methoxide in, into the oil. What we're going to do is we're going to introduce it slowly uh, to assure thorough mixing. What you see here is my processor uh, at my farm. On the left hand side is the uh, intake barrel where we put the raw oil and we use a uh, modified electric water heater as a mixing reactor. Um, and what you see down by my uh, left knee are a couple of five gallon plastic carboys that are fitted with snap lock hose fittings that allow us to safely introduce the uh, methoxide into the reactor without it splashing or spilling or dripping. And then by adjusting the circulating valve we can regulate the uptake of the methoxide and make sure we're getting a thorough mixture. Now we're going to, at the end of, the, of about an hour of, of mixing, we'll have a full reaction. And we're going to turn off our pump, and the glycerin is going to settle out just like it did in our 2-liter soda bottle. Um, in some cases, some reactors like mine, uh, we have a settling tank so we can pump out of the reactor and, and put the finished biodiesel into a, uh, into a settling tank where the glycerin can settle out. Um, that allows us to, to do a second batch while we're waiting to process that first batch. Um, you can't see the separation take place in most reactors, so the best idea is to take a sample and you can watch for a complete reaction in that sample bottle. You can take that in a, a beaker or a plastic bottle or a jar. Um, at this stage we've got our, our complete uh, reaction and the glycerol has sunk to the bottom of our reactor or our settling vessel. And at this point, we're going to take the glycerin off the bottom. And uh, this, this is the beginning of that waste handling stream that I talked about earlier. There are a lot of different things that you can do to deal with that waste uh, glycerol product. Um, uh, some of the potential uh, byproducts that you can make are compost, fertilizer. Uh, you can use it for soap making or feedstock for a biodigester. Some folks have even used it as a feed supplement. Uh, the most important thing is that you, for any of these uses, you have to remove the residual methanol first. And unfortunately, we don't have time to talk too much about methanol removal and recovery. It's a topic of a big discussion, 
but you're going to want to make sure that you're safely and legally um, dealing with the, that methanol before you put that uh, byproduct on the ground or feed it to any livestock. The easiest solution uh, for glycerin is to use it in a waste oil burner. If you've got a waste oil burner in your shop or a neighbor uses a waste oil burner, you can safely um, burn that for heat and, and in that case the methanol um, it doesn't create any kind of problems actually uh, it burns just fine as we know it's uh, racing fuel. So uh, for more information uh, about um, some of the things you can do with the glycerol uh, byproduct I would encourage you to take a look at the Dickinson College website their sustainability department makes biodiesel and they've done some really good preliminary research on the different things that that can be done with it and they've got some information about uh, composting and uh, they're starting a project to use a use it as feedstock in a biodigester and on the right there you see they've got a complete line of um, soap and cleaning products that they make with their glycerin so for more information about that it's available at the Dickinson College website that you see here okay well we've got biodiesel uh, you would think that uh, we're at the end of the process, but we, we're um, really just getting started. Uh, I would encourage you not to take the biodiesel that you have now and dump it right into your um, truck or expensive piece of farm machinery because there are a lot of impurities that are left behind. And what we want to do now is put it through what's called the wash process. It's a simple process. Uh, most folks do it by spraying a fine mist of water across the top of the fuel and as that water falls through the oil uh, to the bottom of the tank it picks up a lot of the impurities the extra salts um, the other uh, stuff that uh, is left behind unreacted chemicals uh, all that kind of stuff and uh, it takes about a gallon of water uh, per gallon of fuel to wash so um, what we do is uh, what you see here just simply spraying water across the top of, a, of the fuel in a 55 gallon drum uh, and we what we don't want to use is a, a regular conventional shower head the, the, the stream is too uh, vigorous uh, it's best to use a mister similar to those used in grocery store or produce departments and those are readily available okay now once again we're, we've got another uh, waste stream issue here we're going to take this um, this wash water off the bottom it's got uh, potassium in it it's got soaps in it um, and we're going to want to filter that there are a number of different filtering tech techniques out there that you can read about and what we're going to want to do is uh, recycle that water we can either recycle it for um, for future wash cycles or it can be used as uh, uh, you know for irrigation purposes but you're going to want to make sure you've uh, filtered that and that you're complying with all local regulations in terms of ground application and the final process is we need to remove we need to drive out that extra water that that uh, is still trapped in the oil and there are a couple ways of dealing with that in a lot of cases folks will just put it out in the sun and and the water will eventually evaporate and the, the uh, biodiesel will clear up. Uh, you can tell, uh, one of the, the rules of thumb is you can tell that your biodiesel is dry when you can read a newspaper through a, a sample. Uh, another technique is to recirculate the oil from the bottom of the tank, uh, spray it across the top of the tank in a similar fashion to the, the wash cycle and, and as uh, it hits the surface area uh, on the top it'll cast off that water um, and it's really really important I can't tell you how important it is to make sure that you get all the water out because water can wreak serious havoc on your injectors and that's one of the, the biggest problems uh, one of the biggest failures uh, is um, injector issues what you see here is a dry tank uh, it's made out of a, a stainless steel milk tank and in this case we are using regular conventional shower heads and they have multiple shower heads uh, to make as vigorous a um, uh, sort of um, reaction across the surface and 
you can drive the, the water out pretty quickly by just simply recirculating from the bottom of the tank and spraying it across the top of the tank like this. Um, you can wash and dry fuel in the same container. I do. I use a 55-gallon wash-dry combination. But again, if you're trying to do multiple batches and, and move those through the system, uh, it's helpful if you have separate wash and dry tanks. So we're going to talk about small batch processing equipment at this point. Um, there are commercially available batch processors on the market for between three and ten thousand dollars. Here are two common designs. The left is commonly known as the Fuel Meister design. It use, uses some uh, poly uh, chemical tanks that are common in the ag sector. Um, a lot of people have used these units and a lot of biodiesel has been made. Uh, there, there have been some issues reported with plastic parts degrading and uh, maybe these units don't have the life span of some other designs, but they're very popular and, and um, a lot of people use them. The one on the right is sort of the other end of the, the spectrum. It's a BioPro unit available for, for through uh, Northern Tool, uh, a company that a lot of us uh, use as a supply house for pumps and things like that. It, it's uh, a stainless steel unit. Um, it's fully automated. They say they their market is uh, folks who don't want to babysit their processor. So, of course, uh, I'm sure being fully automated, it has its own set of issues uh, that need to be dealt with. But um, uh, as you can see, there are a lot of different designs out there um, depending on uh, you know your comfort level um, but for those who have more time than money uh, there are some DIY designs out there and this one is the apple seed processor this is the design that I used um, it was originated by a young lady from San Francisco named Maria Alivert who's known across the country as girl mark uh, she originated the apple seed design and uh, it's called the apple seed because she uh, packed one up a number of years ago and drove from coast to coast several times giving workshops on on how to build these processors kind of like Johnny Appleseed and if you want to read more about uh, Maria's work you can look at her website www.curlmark.com uh, she's got a lot of good information about home built uh, processor design there so let's talk just briefly about a few pitfalls uh, what you see on the right is a sample of uh, some soap that somebody made when they thought they were making biodiesel and uh, most of us who make biodiesel have made a, a, a batch of soap or two in our day. Um, making biodiesel can be time consuming and again time is money you know it, uh, uh, your, your time is, is worth something and uh, you really need to uh, figure out how to do it most efficiently it can be messy, the waste disposal issue that we talked about. Um, there can be spills. Uh, rodents can be an issue. If you're storing biodiesel in five-gallon jugs or if you've got your glycerin uh, stacked out up out beside the barn, um, you can bet that some of our furry little friends are going to chew a hole in one of those and you're going to have a spill on your hands. So it's real important uh, that you keep a clean shop. It can be dangerous. Uh, the fumes again, chemical burns and fire, you're storing um, methanol in 55 gallon drums and that's a highly explosive fuel so uh, you need to be aware of that. Environmentally hazardous, if you have spills it can get into the groundwater. Uh, there are air quality issues that need to be considered and it can be problematic. There can be tax issues and regulations that uh, may hinder your efforts. And we're going to discuss many of these pitfalls in our future webinars. But we don't want to end on a low note, so let's talk about some of the keys to success. Um, it's important to start small. Your, your mistakes will be small if you start small, and you'll make plenty, believe me. Um, plan ahead. Build for the future. Uh, are you using quality parts? You know, are you using brass ball valves? Are you using PVC valves? Uh, how how are those valves going to hold up against the caustic chemicals? You don't want to have to build this thing twice, so it's best to to build a quality unit and get yourself set up um, with something that'll serve you well into the future. 
do your research. You need to be constantly uh, informing yourself about the technology. It's changing rapidly and there are a great bunch of enthusiasts out there who uh, have a very open source attitude about the information and, and they're more than happy to, to share information with you. There are forums on the, the web uh, and a lot of people out there doing it who, who want to share their knowledge with you. Keep a clean shop, like I said. Less waste is less work. Um, share the work. Uh, by sharing the work and sharing the benefits, you can uh, make your process a lot easier if you get together with your neighbors or friends or coworkers and build a processor rather than everybody having their own. You can get together and, uh, and do a lot of the work uh, as a group and you're going to just have a, a lot more efficient and uh, a lot uh, better process. And finally, again, keep it safe and keep it legal. Those are the most important uh, things I can share with you. And uh, with that, I'm going to turn it back over to Al. Thanks, Rich. Going one step further back in the process to the feedstock, we're going to cover uh, oil processing. Filtered waste vegetable oil is a common biodiesel feedstock. But if you're thinking of growing your own oil, here's some things to keep in mind. Big commercial scale processors use mechanical crushers or the chemical solvent hexane to extract the oil or some combination of these two technologies. And while hexane removes 99% of the oil from the oil seed, it's very toxic and it really isn't a practical technology for farm or ranch scale production. Cold pressing using a mechanical crusher will have a lower extraction rate. But again, you're moving away from sh harsh chemicals that create all kinds of environmental and other problems, management problems. An important step from the field crop to fuel cycle is uh, to degum virgin vegetable oil. Many gums will settle out of the oil if it sits for a couple of weeks. But you might want to consider water washing or treating the oil with a mild solution of citric or phosphoric acid and then drying the oil. This will, this will provide a degummed, unrefined feedstock most suitable for biodiesel. There are all kinds of brands and capacities of smaller oil scale Small, smaller oil presses, ranging from $1,000 to $15,000 or more on the market. The presses on the previous page were five-ton rated Kate-style presses, which extrude a flake-like oil seed meal. The one in this photo is a single-cylinder press, which creates a pellet-style meal, which you see coming out of the end of the extruder. There are all kinds of brands and capacities. Oh, excuse me. The expression "you get what you pay for" is appropriate when it comes to buying oil seed pressure. From many farmers, I've heard the story: the less you pay for in pressure, the more setup and operating time you can expect to put in. Here's an example of a one-ton Kate-style crusher located on a central Montana farm. This farmer's experiments with raising an oil seed, crushing them in this press, and making biodiesel from the oil, and feeding the meal to his livestock left him convinced that this crusher was the weak link in the whole field to fuel process. This one-ton crusher operated at 22% efficiency in the test runs way too low to be considered effective or efficient. Regardless of the press size or make, here's some points to keep in mind if you want to achieve an extraction rate of at least 50 percent and preferably closer to 80 percent. The seed should be warm, 100 to 160 degrees Fahrenheit. As many of you may know, soybeans are roasted in advance of any oil seed pressing. Except for the summer months, it might be best to keep your crusher in a shop or other heated building when you're using it. And from my limited experience of farm-based uh, oil seed crushing, running the meal through a second time gets more oil out and renders a, renders, a, renders a drier meal. If you want more information on small-scale 
crushers or the oil seed cleaning and crushing process, you can go to these websites or call the ATRA toll-free number that begins at the end of this presentation. Here are some examples of yield averages for oil seed field crops raised in the U.S. The Camelina yields are for Montana only, although this crop is also raised in a few other northern tier states. Compared to all the other crops on this list here, Camelina is new enough that farm and experiment station yield data is all over the map, ranging from 340 to 2,200 pounds per acre. But if you're considering raising an oil seed crop for biodiesel, there are numbers far more important than anything listed in this chart. First, if you've raised an oil seed in the past, your proven yield is the number you want to work with. If you haven't raised an oil seed but you're in a locale where others are raising oil seeds, the county average for that crop would be a good number to start with. Your expected oil seed crusher efficiency is an important number, as is the weight of the oil. Oil is always lighter than water, but there are slight variances amongst oil seeds. For example, canola oil weighs about 7.3 pounds per gallon, and soy weighs 7.5 pounds per gallon. What you should do is plug the numbers into this formula just below the chart here to determine what your oil yield per acre is. Then divide that number into your annual diesel fuel consumption to at least get a starting point as to how much cropland might have to be devoted to oil seed production for fuel. Here's an example. Let's take a look at the soybean line. I took the soybean yield number in pounds times the oil content of the seed. In this case, that's 19%. Times the crusher efficiency, which the number I used was 70% or 0 0.70, and then divided, the, divided by the oil weight per gallon, 7.5 pounds in this case, to get the oil yield in gallons per acre that you see in the far right-hand column. Keep in mind that 7.5 gallons of oil yields about 7.7 .7 pounds of biodiesel when it's been through the entire process. So a rough rule of thumb is that a gallon of oil will yield about a gallon of biodiesel. Your choice in oil seeds is going to be affected by a lot of factors, and here's the first four. There's a truism about where you can raise oilseed crops, peanuts in the south, soybeans in the south and midwest, and brassicas such as mustards, canola, camelina in the north. But winter varieties of canola and camelina may push the southward limits of where these crops can be raised. Likewise, new varieties of soybeans and climate change may push northwards the growing zones for soybeans. But it's not only where a soy uh, oilseed crop can be raised, but where it fits into a crop rotation and the whole farm operation, really. Mustards and canola can help suppress soil-borne diseases like uh, nematodes. Canola, however, is a real heavy nitrogen feeder, similar to corn and its uh, nutrient demands, whereas soybeans aren't. And sunflowers in a rotation will break up hard pan soils. So there may be a value of this crop beyond simply the oil and meal that you get out of it. Oils and fats are used in human and food and animal feed and may be of much higher value there than being used in biodiesel. And if you raise an oil seed, fuel use may be the last thing that makes sense economically. Aside from oil, there's other bioproducts. There's at least one other major bioproduct uh, in the process here. And that's the oil seed meal, which has value if you have livestock or your neighbors do. Soy meal is actually of higher value, considered of higher value than the oil itself. And other uh, canola, camelina have value as, as oil seed, as an a, a animal feed as well. And some oils have different properties that make them somewhat more useful for biodiesel. Here's four of them. There's good reasons why 85% of biodiesel currently produced in this country is made from soy oil. It's relatively plentiful, and it's a good oil for biodiesel because of its chemical properties, some of which are summarized here in this slide. Sometimes an oil seed's strong suit in one use can be its weakness in another. Camelina has 
superior coal flow properties, but it's fairly it's a fairly unstable oil because it's high in omega-3 fatty acids, which make the meal a very attractive animal feed. Camelina can be made into a stable biodiesel, but the chemical process has to be modified somewhat compared to what you would do with the three other oils listed in this slide. A few things to keep in mind. Oil is going to be about 80% of your cost uh, in terms of biodiesel production if you buy or grow your own oil. The items listed here in the slide are major expensive equipment, oil, methanol, catalyst. And it, the real important one is labor. If you assign a value to your time, what's it going to be? Zero, ten dollars an hour, twenty dollars an hour? But just even posing these questions of what your time is worth soon begs other questions if you're going to consider on-farm biodiesel production. What are your goals? And for what reasons do you want to do this? And what's your price point? By that I mean at what price does conventional biodiesel have to be to even consider making or using biodiesel? I've asked experts in biodiesel production what the standard diesel price point is that justifies making biodiesel. And their answer is always the same. It depends. Unique circumstances, distance from markets, scale of production, price of petroleum, and the biodiesel inputs. And yes, one's own goals all come into play. If self-reliance energy independence and sustainability are important goals for you. Maybe labor costs and diesel price points aren't all that important. So what Rich and I would like to do next is share a few examples of folks on farms and ranches and in rural communities who make and use biodiesel, all with different goals in mind and all with different approaches as to how they reach those goals. Rich? Thanks, Al. Yeah, one of the groups I wanted to talk about is the Yoderville Biodiesel Collective right here in Iowa. They're one of a number of co-ops around the country, uh, groups of folks who have gotten together uh, to make biodiesel in a collaborative effort. And, you know, they they got started when a, a, a couple of fellas were thinking about, um, you know, fueling their lives more sustainably and um, and and depending less on uh, foreign oil um, and so they uh, got together and, and started making their own biodiesel. Um, they're located in Kelowna, Iowa or near Kelowna uh, from the, the surrounding area and some of the unique things about what they do is they collect oil from over 10 locations. They collect waste oil from restaurants. They use the french fry grease uh, and they hold weekly brew nights where everybody gets together and they split up the responsibilities and everybody's got a different task and they're able to really do a, an efficient job of, of making biodiesel. You can read more about them at their website that you see here. Another group that uh, I'd like to mention is the Piedmont Biofuels Group. They're in North Carolina. Um, they're a group that has an educational uh, component and um, and they're very concerned with the environmental implications of, of making biodiesel. Uh, they're a worker and member-owned cooperative. Um, they make pure uh, B100 and provide that to the community. Uh, they're very, um, very involved in quality control issues and uh, and how to efficiently uh, collect waste oil. They do a lot of educational efforts. They lobby the North Carolina legislature as well as national representatives on behalf of biodiesel and alternative fuels. And they have an internship program. So as you can see, they do more than just make biodiesel. It's, it's uh, more about the environmental and the sort of community uh, sustainability aspects for the folks at Piedmont. And you can see more about them at their website here. I think Al's got a couple of farm uh, examples he'd like to share as well. Thanks, Rich. Thad Doy is an Oklahoma farmer who started crushing oil seeds and making biodiesel in 2005. He's pretty far away from a sunflower processor, so he thought there may be more value in making his own fuel from the sunflowers he raised and feeding the meal to his cattle. Thad's sister, Demona, is an ag economist. While Thad was keeping records, Demona was penciling out all of this out over a three-year span. 
That had a bumper crop in 2005, but that was followed by a severe drought the next year. So you might say Thad saw the best of times and the worst of times in his biodiesel experiment. The 438 a gallon price that you see referred to in the slide includes all land costs and all production costs, including depreciation on equipment, which was about an $8,200 investment for him. That includes Thad's time priced at $850 an hour and no methanol recovery. His sister calculated that if he dropped his labor value to $5.75 an hour and recovered at least 60% of the lost methanol, his per gallon cost for sunflower biodiesel would drop to about $3.62 a gallon. Zach Worth's Rocking Z Ranch was a bit too far away from his fuel distributor, so he th that fuel distributor charged him a premium to deliver fuel as far out as he was. Zach decided to be worth trying to uh, see if he could make his own diesel. He first retrofitted his diesel irrigation pump to burn straight vegetable oil, biodiesel, and petrodiesel. Then he added a 80 gallon tank, single, single tank, uh, easy biodiesel reactor to make fuel for the vehicles on his ranch. Zach buys his oil and 230 a gallon was his cost in 2008. So let's take a look at some of his, the numbers he did share and then compare that to the 2009 number you see here as well. These are his operating costs for his biodiesel, seasonally made biodiesel in 2008. They do not include a value assigned to his labor, utilities aren't included, nor his equipment depreciation. Zach pointed out at a summer 2009 farm tour that this year in 2009, he bought veggie oil for $1.70 a gallon, 60 cents more than what he paid for it here, as you can see, in, in 2008. And methanol nearly doubled in price. Uh, it reached $7 a gallon at one high point um, in 2009. So those were the two main factors in his biodiesel costs jumping over $1 a gallon in less than a year. And you'll recall that tax bio, uh, taxed over the road petrodiesel was pushing about four fifty a gallon in the summer of two thousand eight and was about two dollars less than that by the spring of two thousand nine so Zach's fuel prices were almost counter cyclical to to standard bio our standard petrodiesel what rich and I have tried to provide here is a glimpse at many of the factors one must weigh if you're considering on-farm or on-ranch biodiesel production based on our own experiences and observations. For more information from experts on this topic, here's some websites to start your own exploration of making biodiesel on-farm. Everything ranging from farmer stories to uh, small-scale oilseed and biodiesel processing spreadsheets where you can do all the calculations in advance of ever even buying the equipment if that's the path you want to go in terms of developing a plan. And on that note, I guess I'd turn it back over to Jeff. Thank you, Al, and thank you, Rich, for the presentation on uh, basics of biodiesel production. We do have time for a few questions from our, uh, our listeners today. Um, I'll ask uh, some of these questions to both of you and see what uh, we have in terms of time to answer them. Um, Al, one question we got for you was, um, a uh, listener had a question about the crushers, and he said, do I have always to buy my own crusher, or are there, are there alternatives to buying my own crusher? Well, there actually is, but it depends on where one, one is located. Um, often there will be commercial oil, oil seed crushers who will do what's called toll crushing. They essentially take your crop and crush it, keep part of it as payment, or else they will charge you a per ton price. Um, to return all of your oil to you. Now that's probably more, that price varies, it has to, it's going to vary by locale, but what's going to be real important is probably penciling out whether it makes sense over time if one is far away from that crusher to actually buy your own uh, crusher and do that uh, step in the process on farm, or whether it's cheaper over the long haul to uh, truck it and then truck it home. Truck it there and truck it back. Mm -hmm. Good. 
Um, what about replacing heating fuel or kerosene with biodiesel? Is this a viable alternative? I'll field that one. Uh, yes, the the basic answer is yes. It is a, a viable alternative. Um, I personally have had quite a bit of experience with using um, biodiesel as heating fuel. And uh, as I said before, the, the glycerol um, can be burned in waste oil furnaces, but the regular uh, finished biodiesel is a, a very good um, alternative to, to home heating oil. So if you're heating with oil, uh, especially um, I find that uh, it, it's a good way to use um, any extra biodiesel I've got at the end of the summer uh, because of the um, sort of issues having to do with cold weather performance. I'll just use my remaining biodiesel from summer production as, as heating fuel. And, and uh, you can definitely blend it up to 50% without any modifications to your um, home heating uh, unit. And uh, with a little tweaking, you can, can easily go above that. So, yes, it's, it, it, in many cases, it, it will replace um, heating fuel and kerosene. Mm -hmm. How about um, the issues about taxation and uh, do you have to pay road tax on biodiesel fuel? If, Rich, you probably have an answer for this as well, but I'll start. If that fuel is used on road, then one has to pay tax on it. There's some variation among states as to whether it's used off-road and if it's taxed or not. Um, Montana, for example, because there's no provision in state law for biodiesel to be exempt from taxation, allows uh, producers such as Zach Worth to, they have to pay the tax and then it's refunded to them um, because there's no provision in law right now to exempt biodiesel from taxation. But that varies from state to state. Rich, anything you want to add? Uh, I would just echo what Al said. Um, you want to make sure before you get started that you are as aware as you possibly can be, and it can be a Byzantine uh, process uh, sorting out all your state and federal regulations. But we will, uh, as we said before, uh, on March 25th, 2010, we'll be having a webinar that uh, will try and tackle some of the specifics of those taxation issues. So I'd invite everybody to join us for that. Good. Um, we had a question too. We talked several times about the examples of on-farm production of biodiesel. Um, is there a, any rule of thumb of what percentage of your farm you might have to devote to producing oil seeds if you wanted to power your own farm? Or have you seen examples of farmers trying to become pretty much self-sufficient in terms of their own uh, biodiesel production for using in their own uh, tractors and other vehicles to be energy self-sufficient, if you will, for fuel oil? Well, <laughs> like the price point question, the answer is always it depends. The biggest single variable is going to be how much fuel is used by any given farm seasonally or year round that they would want to replace with biodiesel. Um, and but there's been discussion amongst enough farmers now to say probably the midpoint uh, is about 10% of one's cropland may have to be committed to an oil seed. But again, it's totally dependent on, on, on fuel demand, what, what's, what's actually being used, uh, what the yield might be of a particular oil seed crop and crusher efficiency, host of factors like that that would have to, uh, I'd encourage people to go back a few slides in this uh, in this presentation we just did and uh, write down that formula to determine what that might be. But the range is considered 5 to 15 percent of one's cropland uh, devoted to oil seeds for, for fuel production. Mm -hmm. have, have you, Al, have you seen this actually happening in reality? Are there farmers who are doing this right now? There are, but I think it'd be too early. <sighs> It's too early to determine if that calculation of 10 percent or if that range of 5 to 15 percent is accurate. Uh, I think it's one of those things we have to stay tuned and see what actually plays out over the next couple of years. Okay. Uh, Rich, a couple of process questions here for you. One was a question about why don't we use ethanol instead of methanol in the production process? 
Uh -huh. Well, that's a great question, and and we most of us would like to use ethanol, and ideally, we'd like to make that ethanol on farm and uh, and you know make as much of the the um, biodiesel right on farm as possible. Um, unfortunately, as a lot of people probably know, there are issues with ethanol having to do with its characteristic of um, retaining moisture. Uh, this is a big issue in in the large-scale ethanol industry, and a, and a good portion of energy um, goes into driving the, the water out of, of ethanol. So um, unfortunately, right now, uh, it's problematic. It, it can... Um, uh, make for uh, for problems if you've got uh, wet ethanol and you're trying to mix that mix, mix your biodiesel with that. So meth, uh, methanol is just a lot more reliable for the the home brewer. But down the road, we would definitely like to see uh, a way that the home brewer could uh, potentially brew their own ethanol and use part of that ethanol to make their biodiesel. So, mm -hmm. and another. I guess our final uh, question for our listeners right now is about using the meal after crushing and how either selling the meal or finding some economical use for that can impact the economics of the whole biodiesel production process. Um, what have you seen farmers doing with the meal and what are the markets for that? Most of the meal is used for animal feed. Soy, the reason it is uh, so heavily used as a biodiesel is that the oil is really considered the byproduct in the crushing project product process. And uh, uh, the meal is what, what is being uh, heavily uh, marketed as an animal feed. Similar with canola, um, also with camelina. Sunflower obviously can be used. That meal can be used in a ration. The uh, only other uses I've heard of it is with mustards and canola being field applied, the meal being field applied for um, its natural herbicidal and nematicidal values. But that's pretty limited. I think it's more a function of some experimenting that's gone on and maybe not having ready markets for the, for the feed. There's also been some work done to uh, convert particularly canola, or excuse me, camelina meal into um, a soil amendment for uh, gardeners and whatnot. So um, really animal feed is its top use. I think we're going to see more over time as, um, as, as science, scientists and uh, business people start to figure out what alternative uses for the meal might be. All right. Um, I think that ends our questions, uh, Alan Rich. Um, for both of you, do you have any, any final thoughts on the biodiesel production process and, and where you see the trends in the future or the, the optimism you're feeling or what's, what's your kind of summary wrap-up on biodiesel production and its, its future here in the United States? Al, you want to take that first? <laughs> <laughs> I'll take a whack at it. Um, <laughs> okay. Probably what... In the last year, with the wild swings in, in uh, commodity prices and fuel and oil prices, and particularly in the last almost two years now, large-scale biodiesel production really has taken a hit. There are plants that are being shuttered on, that were making biodiesel, and there are other large-scale commercial plants slated to go online that simply haven't. Having said that, I think we can only be cautiously optimistic that due to the work of small-scale and mid-scale operators, biodiesel production is going to continue. And at that large scale, what sort of new planning or approach will be taken to make sure we don't uh, have another cyclical crash in uh, commercial scale production? That's sort of my take on it right now. I think there's reason to be optimistic uh, given the the simplicity of this fuel, the fact that it can be, it can indeed be homegrown. We don't have to import palm oil, um, and if we have reasonable expectations of what can be done, we burn almost 80 billion gallons of, uh, of petrodiesel in this country per year. Right now, we have the oil feed, oil seed stock, 
and animal fats and whatnot to make about maybe five percent of that. So as long as we, uh, you know, don't have overly high expectations, we should be all right. Rich. Yeah, I, I would agree with what um, what you said, Al. I, I would uh, just add that, as you said, um, while the large-scale operations are, are going through the ups and downs of uh, commodity prices and fuel prices and, and competing in, in the broader marketplace, um, we as small producers have the advantage of the sort of small is beautiful uh, um, theory of economics. We we are, you know, we're unburdened by uh, by things like uh, return on investment uh, in in a lot of cases because, um, uh, in in our case, we're using waste oil, um, and uh, and we can keep our prices very low. In the case of farmers, um, it's it's more of an issue of of making it pencil out. But um, but there are things like your time. You mentioned, you know, what is your time worth? Is it ten dollars? Is it twenty dollars an hour? Well, you know, is making your fuel on farm something that can keep you working on the farm? Is it something uh, as opposed to going to a uh, part-time job in town or or something else? I mean, uh, is it is it something that can help folks? Um, work at farming and I think that's one of the really important things to remember about it is is that it has it has the potential for the smaller family farmer um, to to uh, add to the diversification of their operation and uh, keep them working on the farm and making that farming operation as efficient and profitable as possible well rich and now I want to thank you both for your expertise and time spent uh, sharing the basics of biodiesel production with us all. And I'll remind our listeners that if you want to ask more specific questions about biodiesel production, if you're a farmer or work with those who serve farmers, you're free, welcome to call our ATRA technical hotline. Um, information about the ATRA program, which is the National Sustainable Agriculture Information Service, is available on our website, which you've seen on our screen there, um, atra.ncat.org. We also have many publications on farm energy and biodiesel and some on production, some of the, about the sustainability of biodiesel production and other topics surrounding uh, farm energy. Um, again, this is the first of a three-part biodiesel webinar series we're putting together. There will be two more um, up on our website after the first of the year, one in early mid-January on biodiesel safety and permits and one towards the end of March on biodiesel taxation and production incentives. On behalf of the National Center for Appropriate Technology, my name is Jeff Berkby, and thank you, Al and Rich, for attending the Biodiesel webinar, and thank you for listening to this program.